Nice to be here. Hello. Hey, sir. Good to see you again. Good to see you again. How you doing? Right. Good, good, good. 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 All right. Thanks. Thrill, thrill to be. I'm, uh, I'm ready. Come for on. You. Let's do All it. Right. Very good. Hey, guys. We got a whole bunch of grief last time for not letting you hold your own mic, and I'm like, we don't let amateurs do that. Man. You know what? I could handle it. <laughs> okay, okay. All right, next time. Next time you get Although to hold this your own is mic. Little... Yeah. Let's. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you ready, sir? Yeah. All right, here we go. Mr. President, good to talk to you again, sir. Great to be here. So you spent the first couple of years of your presidency, as you say, trying to drag the economy out of a ditch. Here we are now. Recovery's five years old. Jobs are back. Growth is back. And yet you have chosen an issue where you are arm wrestling members of your own party. You're aligning with the GOP who've spent six years throwing everything they can at you to stop you. Why this issue now? Well, keep in mind that we started this issue uh, four or five years ago. And in my trips to Asia, what became very clear is this is the fastest growing part of uh, the world economy, the most populous, the most dynamic. And if we are not there helping to shape the rules of the road, then U.S. businesses and U.S. workers are going to be cut out because there's a pretty big country there called China yep. that uh, is growing fast, has great gravitational pull, and often operates with different sets of rules. So we started this negotiation, uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, recognizing that a third of our recovery has been driven by exports, that typically export industries pay higher wages. And if we want to make sure that we're selling American products, American services uh, into the not just the next decade, but the next several decades, then we've got to have high standards, high labor protections, high environmental protections in that part of the market, that part of the world uh, where we need to do business. I get all that, and I understand it, but you brought up China, so I'm going to go there. China is the 800-pound gorilla that is not in this deal. You say you want to write the rules of trade for the global economy so that the Chinese don't. On the theory that this agreement is about our place in the global economy, how confident are you that the Chinese, who, as you know, do what they want when they want, the way they want to do it, how confident are you that they're going to follow? Well, they've already started putting out feelers uh, about what the possibilities of them uh, participating at some point. To you? Uh, to us, to Jack Lew, the Treasury Secretary. The fact is that if we have uh, 11 of the leading economies in the Asia-Pacific region who have agreed to enforceable labor standards, enforceable environmental standards, uh, strong IP protections, non-discrimination uh, against uh, foreign firms that are operating access to those markets, reduce tariffs, then China is going to have to at least take those international norms into account. And we are still pursuing strong bilateral economic relations with China. We still pressure them around issues like currency or the subsidies that uh, they may be engaged in or theft of intellectual property. We still directly deal with them on those issues, but it sure helps if they are surrounded with countries that are operating with these same kinds of high standards that, by the way, we already abide by. So part of what we're doing here is we're leveling up as opposed to a race to the bottom, uh, which means no labor protections, no environmental protections. We want to make sure that there's a level playing field that's going to allow us to be successful and will help to shape uh, trade and commerce, uh, not just in the region, but in the world for a long time to come. Let me get back to the American economy here for a minute. Um, economists generally, generally agree, and I'll get some pushback here from economists who will hear this, but they generally agree that in the aggregate, free trade is a net plus. 25 years ago, 20 years ago, the last time this country dealt with a big free trade agreement, it didn't work out well for a whole lot of people. Mm -hmm. Wages were lost, jobs were lost. Do you understand the pushback on that that you're getting? Absolutely. And, and I've said repeatedly publicly, there is a reason why you've got labor unions and some of my best friends in the Democratic Party concerned about uh, any trade agreement. Because the truth is, is that globalization, advances in technology, big cargo containers shipping goods in that are sold yep. 
through the distribution and, and logistics networks in this country, over the last 20, 30 years, played a role in uh, reducing the leverage that workers had, played a role in outsourcing. But the argument that I make to my friends whose values I share is that you can't fight the last war. The truth is today, if there is a company in the United States that wants to find low-wage labor, if that's their business model, I think it's a mistake, but if that's their business model, they can do it now under existing rules. NAFTA did not have labor protections or environmental protections that were enforceable. That was a side letter. So part of what I'm saying to, to our, our folks is that precisely because the existing rules oftentimes disadvantage U.S. workers and U.S. businesses, for us to create new rules that raise standards in an important part of the world, including, by the way, the two countries that were signatories to NAFTA, Canada and Mexico, so that now suddenly they've got to have stronger labor rules. If, if we've got potentially hundreds of millions of workers who are now subject to international labor standards that weren't there before, and now when we're working with them, even if they're not enforcing those standards uh, 100%, we've got enough leverage to start raising those standards. That is good for us. So, so just because past experience raised concerns around outsourcing, we've got to think about the future and where our economy is now going. It's not going to be based on low-wage work. It's going to be based on high-skill, high-value-added, high-wage work, which we're good at. That means that we've got to be able to access those markets to sell those goods. Which is based on a change in the American economy, and yes. we all know that, right? Now, it's moving toward knowledge-based, it's moving toward innovation and away from manufacturing, right. but there's still a huge manufacturing base in this country. So that brings up this question. You know, last week, or a couple of weeks ago, I guess, in, in Oregon, you went out to Nike, right. and you gave a long speech on, on the TPP, and you said, when the rules are fair, we win every time. Right. We win every time. And I get that you're using the presidential we here, right? The national we. <laughs> but... But what do you say to the blue collar worker who's lost wages over the past decade, who's lost perhaps a job, to the small business owner who's had to shut down? How do you say to that person, listen, this is really for the greater good here? Well, no, no, no. But keep in mind that it, this is important not just for the Boeings of the world. This is important for small businesses and medium sized businesses. They constitute the majority of exporters. And we know that wages are higher for firms that also are accessing international markets. And even the large firms like a Boeing have hundreds, maybe thousands of suppliers all across the country, many of them small and medium-sized businesses who benefit and who are able to hire more workers because they have access to these new markets. Nike is actually a great example. The, the truth is, is that the footwear industry in the United States got decimated. Now, part of that was technology. Part of it was globalization and much lower labor costs elsewhere. The reason I went to Nike is because they said that if this passes, they're in a position to bring 10,000 new jobs to the United States, partly because technology is now advancing essentially 3D printing for footwear, right. where the labor costs per shoe are inherently lower because of technology. On the other hand, the need for knowledge, skills, reliability, all those design, all those things have increased. This is part of the reason why since I came into office, we've seen the strongest growth in manufacturing since the 1990s. Part of that is we made some good decisions around the auto industry, but part of it is generally we're actually seeing insourcing as opposed to outsourcing. There are a bunch of manufacturers who are saying, you know what, it's actually smart for us to be in the United States. Low energy costs, great workers, great infrastructure, access to the largest market. So manufacturing has been growing faster during my presidency than at any time since the 90s and faster than the overall growth of the economy. But even manufacturing's changed. It's not, you know, if you go into an auto uh, company uh, where it used to take 1,000 workers in a factory, now it might take 100. Those jobs aren't coming back regardless of where we go, because it really is be, uh, due to technology. What we can do, though, is continue to expand our markets, and 95% of the world's marketplace is outside of the United States. We've got to have access to it. 
I understand when you say that, that um, things have grown over your administration and that um, uh, manufacturing is still solid in this country. One of the things I don't understand, though, and this is a larger free trade debate, which we have been having in this country for decades now, right. it is generally acknowledged to be a good, as I said before, and yet one never hears from proponents of free trade, yourself included, that there are losers. Full stop. There, there are losers. I, 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 the truth is, Guy, if you look over my interviews, you'll see I've said there are losers, and we have to take account of those losers. The question is, are there a lot more winners than losers? And the answer in this case is yes. But that doesn't mean that there is not going to be some impact on some sectors of the economy, by definition. That's going to be true anyway, by the way, but it may be uh, that as a consequence of this trade deal, there are particular markets, there are particular niche uh, uh, parts of the economy where we've got to provide help to transition and to retool and adapt. That's part of the reason why part of this package includes trade adjustment assistance. But one of the, the basic premises for me in, in pursuing this is that we can't just draw a moat and pull up the drawbridge around our economy. We are completely uh, woven into the global economy. We're the hub to many uh, to, to a large extent, of the global economy. So the question is, how do we construct a set of rules, but then also how do we make sure that we're adapting and using the, the incredible advantages we have uh, to the, the best of our ability? And so when I talk to labor leaders, for example, I say, you are absolutely right that there's been growing inequality, and some of that has to do with globalization and technology. The answer is not to not trade anymore. The answer is, how do we upgrade our skills? How do we make sure that the laws and the tax rules and, and, and how companies compensate uh, their workers versus their CEOs, how are those rules fair? And if we do that well, then we can address those issues. But we're not going to address those issues by not trading with Japan. Uh, we're not going to address those issues by pretending that the global supply chain doesn't exist. Uh, the same is true uh, when it comes to uh, environmental issues. If we want to solve something like climate change, which was one of my highest priorities, then I've got to be able to get into places like Malaysia and say to them, this is in your interest. What leverage do I have to get them to stop deforestation? Well, part of the leverage is if I'm in a trade relationship with them that allows me to raise standards, now they have to start thinking about how, how quick they're chopping down their forests and uh, what kinds of standards they need to apply to, the, to, to environmental uh, you know, conservation. So we have to engage, not withdraw. And I think the big mistake that some of my progressive friends make when it comes to trade is not the values they're pursuing or the very legitimate concerns they have about some of the tra uh, past trade deals. The, the issue is, are you now identifying uh, what's going to make the biggest difference in helping American workers compete and prosper. And that's not to shut off trade. That's designing good trade agreements and then doing the things that are fully in our control in this country, like raising our minimum wage, like making sure that uh, we are providing job training and, and apprenticeship programs, making sure that our education system works, making sure we're investing in R&D, making sure we've got a fair tax system and we're closing corporate loopholes that allow us to fund things like infrastructure, all that stuff has to be at the center of our agenda. Last thing, sir, there are a lot of issues in this free trade debate that play directly into the election next fall, yeah. right? Economic inequality, right. opportunity, the wealth gap. What do you figure the average American's economy looks like to them right now? The person making the median income, $53,000 a year. I think they feel better than they did when I came into office. Uh, I think they, they feel somewhat more stable, but they are still traumatized by seeing their home values drop as fast as they did, by seeing their 401ks shrink, uh, even though they've now more than recovered uh, their value if they uh, left those 401ks uh, untouched. So they still have those memories of instability, and that's made them cautious. I also think that the, the long-term trend that predates the last economic crisis and predates my administration, which is 
incomes and wages flatlining at a time when corporate profits sh and, and the stock market have all been booming, and, and the winner-take-all elements of our economy have, have been entrenched, I think that continues to concern them. And my hope is that next year, part of what we discuss is how to combine a competitiveness and growth agenda with a inclusive, broad-based, middle-class economics agenda. And those things, I do not believe, are contradictory. Sometimes they get framed as either you're for free trade or you are for a strong worker voice. Either you are for uh, the unfettered market or uh, you are for a higher minimum wage. And my attitude is that we have to be for both. We have to compete in the world stage. The world is not slowing down. Technology is not stopping, and technology has probably had a bigger effect on the economy than anything like trade has. So we've got to continually adapt. We've got to be nimble. We've got to be efficient. But we also have to be fair, and we have to give everybody access. And we've got to make sure that uh, those at the very top are not using their economic wealth to influence the political process in ways that disadvantage middle class and working class folks. And if we do these things simultaneously, think about fairness, but also about growth and efficiency, that turns out to be the best recipe for growth and prosperity. Uh, and that's part of what has always been the hallmark of the American economy. When the middle class grows and there are ladders into the middle class and everybody's participating and income inequality and wealth inequality is not too skewed, that tends to be when we've got all cylinders clicking and we can compete against anybody. Mr. President, thanks very much for your time, sir. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. It's always good to talk to a well-informed journalist. Thank you, sir. Appreciate, Appreciate that. It.